Toronto in 1978 and 1982 respectively. He was an assistant professor of sinology at Würzburg University, a professor of <coughs> Chinese literature and history of ideas at the Tübingen University, dean of humanities at the same university, the chair of Chinese studies at Trier University, and the dean of humanities at the same university, dean emeritus of the same university. His fields of interest include aesthetics and ethics of modern and pre-modern China, pre-modern Chinese literature and literary theory, cross-cultural dialogue and communication between China and the West, Asian and universal ethics, which made him a member of the UNESCO Advisory Group for Universal Ethics. He has organized a number of international conferences since 1991 and was president of the Academy du Midi in 2003 to 2010. He was editor and author of several publications, which include books and journals. And some of them are the following. He's the editor of Chinese Thought in a Global Context, a dialogue between Chinese and Western philosophical approaches. Chinese Ethics in a Global Context, Moral Basis of Contemporary Societies, in 2002. Intercultural Dialogue with China, 2000. Aesthetic, Aesthetics and Literary Theory in China, from, the, from tradition till modernity. And he has also been working on numerous projects, two of which are Europe Asia Service Trier, a project which involves the establishment of a multimedia and computer based project of China related intercultural training for managers and business people, Chinese internet development, regional and cultural forms of a global medium, which is an interdisciplinary project together with the Department of Media Science, Trier University. The title of this paper, Chinese and Western Aesthetics, Some Comparative Considerations. Dear friends, lovers of wisdom, we present to you Professor Dr. Karl Heinz Paul. Let me, uh, first of all, like my previous speakers, express my gratitude and also my admiration for to this place, my gratitude, particularly to Professor Cole, my colleague, for organizing this great conference, for inviting me here. This is my first time in the Philippines, and it's a great experience for me. And it's an honor to be invited to such a great event, the 400th anniversary of the oldest Western institution of learning university in East Asia. As the chairman already mentioned, it is a difficult hour to be assigned to. Uh, I uh, expect that some of you might want to doze off. Well, I will try my best to keep you entertained, uh, at least intellectually entertained. Uh, let me also say a few more words about uh, my history. I come from Trier. This is a little place in Germany that uh, most of you, I suppose, are not familiar with. I don't want to say uh, you better should be, but uh, uh, it's worthwhile to know about this place, uh, not only because it's the oldest city in Germany, founded by the Romans more than 2,000 years ago, but also because it was the seat of uh, Constantine the Great before he set off to Constantinople. So uh, Constantine the Great, as you know, uh, he uh, managed to establish the Christian faith as a state religion. And uh, if you have a Christian university here in the Philippines, you it's also thanks to uh, his uh, achievement. And then, dialectically, if you will, uh, it is also the birthplace of the greatest saint uh, of uh, Chinese modernity, that is uh, Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now I will be talking about aesthetics. Um, I realize I'm the odd man out here talking about this topic. Um, uh, most of you talk about uh, metaphysics, uh, moral philosophy, Thomism and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm talking about aesthetics and now you could start to talk about, discuss the question if aesthetics is actually part of uh, philosophy, uh, but uh, we'll leave that aside and uh, uh, just accept it that way, the way it is. Well, uh, let me begin with some general observations. 
Uh, athletics is an epistemic discipline. And uh, as that, it is part of the sciences and humanities which have been set up by Western academics. Sciences and humanities have become by now systems with universal or global significance. And there's also a certain universalistic claim to natural sciences and the humanities. But you should keep in mind, sciences and humanities are in a way a European invention. And there is the inclination everywhere on the globe to define concepts and categories on the basis of this specific European tradition. According to European, by now, of course, also uh, American preferences. And aesthetics is part of this. It is part of this Eurocentric academic endeavor. But other than in the natural sciences, there are still significant differences in the humanistic disciplines. Arts and aesthetics, I would dare to say, form particularly significant parts of a country. They belong to the sphere that we define as cultural identity. What does constitute cultural identity? It would suggest language, first of all. Then the cultural framework that we have of myth and images. There are references to literature, to art, to religion and philosophy. Altogether, you could call it a symbolic and the aesthetic orientation. That is a, a very important part of cultural identity. Now, let's look at the role of aesthetics in modern China. I would dare to say that aesthetics assumed a very special place in China's grappling with Western thought. I will get back to this topic at the end of my paper. Uh, aesthetics constituted, first of all, a realm relatively free of politics. And second, philosophy of art as part of aesthetics offered Chinese intellectuals the possibility of linking up with their own traditional ideas. When the Chinese, at the beginning of the 20th century, began to define themselves in relationship to the West, which was an important task for them, they understood their own culture as an essentially aesthetic culture. For this reason, aesthetics is important for the understanding of all the discussions that you have today about the so-called Chineseness of the Chinese. Now, uh, we should also look into the meaning of aesthetics. Uh, as you know, uh, aesthetics in the Western tradition derives from uh, Greek uh, meaning of uh, sensual perception. But the, this uh, term aesthetics, the way the Chinese understand it, uh, arrived in China via Japan. And uh, they translated aesthetics in a particular way. It's translated as meishue. Meishue means the study of beauty. If you would want to re-translate this into our language, into an English language, you could retranslate it as beautology. But this is somewhat misleading if you, if you uh, talk about aesthetics in China, because the category of the beautiful, which had been so important in Western history of ideas, neither in the form of natural nor as artistic beauty, played any significant role in traditional China. Instead, you have notions of naturalness, of harmony, and such. I will go into it later. So what is traditional Chinese aesthetics? It is basically a modern perspective on pre-modern Chinese art. It includes particularly poetry, calligraphy, and painting, but it also includes, of course, architecture, pottery, bronzes, music, martial arts, important. There's, it is, of course, impossible to find common traits to all of these disciplines. But since poetry, calligraphy, and painting, as the most prominent scholarly arts, uh, feature prominently here in this uh, respect, uh, I will be talking mainly about these traditions, and particularly about poetry, because poetry is the main um, art, the main literary art in China. 
in the Western tradition, you have since the Greeks, you have uh, the, the drama, the tragedy, you have the epos, like the Homerian ep uh, epics, and you have the lyrics, the uh, poetry. In China, you have mainly poetry as the uh, medium of uh, literary expression. These are now the things that I'll be talking about uh, in the next half an hour. Uh, they are the elements of traditional Chinese aesthetics. First of all, I will go into the nature of aesthetic writings very briefly uh, in comparison to the Western tradition, of course. Then I will be talking about the concept of rule or regularity versus naturalness, which uh, leads to a notion of a living rule or living rules. Then I'll be talking about practice leading to perfection. Then very important in my view, suggestiveness or openness in the work of art. And then uh, lastly, the qualities of an artist, with other words, his creative power. I consider these uh, five points, or four points I should say, two, three, four, and five, uh, significant elements of a Chinese aesthetic. They're not to be mistaken as uh, uh, not to be mistaken as the Chinese aesthetics. They're just uh, elements that have been very important in the history of reception in their, what we call the German Wirkungsgeschichte. And I will uh, compare these elements then in the end with some elements in Kant's aesthetics, uh, particularly in Kant's uh, critique of judgment. First point was the nature of aesthetic writings in China. You're probably familiar with the uh, Western tradition, beginning with the Greek uh, philosophers, with Plato and Aristotle. Here we have uh, a, a tradition of systematic discussions on the concept of beauty, or as in Aristotle, this poetics, uh, systematic discussion of uh, the main categories of literature. Three categories that I just mentioned before. In China, we don't have any corpus of that type of writing. We have rather unsystematic writings that are, that are meant to probe into the essence of artistic expression and creativity. And uh, the main corpus probes into literary creativity, literary expression. Some works also, of course, into painting, into artistic expression. And often this is done through the medium of poetry. So we have, instead of a discursive tradition of writings about uh, literature, about art, about aesthetics, about beauty. You have poems about poetry. You have poems about art. This is quite distinct to the Western tradition. Now, uh, my second point is uh, regularity or rule versus nationalism. This is, in my view, a very important uh, way of looking at Chinese aesthetics. Because traditional Chinese aesthetics Poetics and also art theory give way to two seemingly contradictory notions. To naturalness on one hand, derived from Taoist uh, ideas, Zeran, and regularity or rule in Chinese, Fa, the concept of Fa. I could give you an example, but I uh, only want to mention it here. It would uh, go too long and I would probably go over time. Uh, I would show you a, a, a so called regular poem. Uh, these regular poems, they flourished in the Tang Dynasty, that is the 6th until 10th century. And these uh, poems, if you start reading them, if you start to appreciate uh, Chinese poetry, you can't leave them. It's just, you get addicted to it, at least it to me. And uh, it, it's a wonderful way of expressing yourself within a strict set of rules. And these strict uh, set of rules, they concern the length and number of lines, they concern the tone patterns. You might know that the Chinese language is a tonal language. You have certain tones that have to be distinguished. And you have, as a, a most salient feature, you have so-called parallels. I will uh, give you an example later of the parallels in the case. Uh, in spite of these strict set of rules, of this a strict set of rules, you have in the end though a feeling of naturalness and ease. And this uh, reminds me of a, a dictum of uh, Goethe. True mastery only reveals itself in restriction. Or in German, in der Beschränkung zeigt sich erst der Meister. There are linguistic 
roots of regularity or rule. First of all, we have the structure of the Chinese written language, the classical written language. We have single characters with single meanings and with a uh, pronunciation of only one syllable. And this can result in neatly regular arrangements uh, of parallel lines. And this is completely unknown in the West. We have, of course, uh, parallelism also as a rhetoric device in, in our tradition. But you can't do it as neatly as you can do it in China. Yeah, I'll just give you here an example. Here you have a, a so-called parallel couplet. It reads from the right to the left, upper right to the lower left. Shreya so shita. So the elegance of a room is not defined by its size. The scent of flowers does not depend on their number. What you have here is neatly matched uh, categories of words, um, for example, colors, numbers, and such things, uh, that uh, are being pronounced with one syllable. They have one single character. For this reason, you can really arrange them quite nicely parallel. You can, you would not detect at first sight that the two sentences in English would be parallel to each other. Take a look at them again. But they are, right? <clears throat> so this is the linguistic uh, root of um, regularity of rule. There are also, we want ideological roots to regularity. You have the concept of fa. Uh, I don't want to go into it. Um, this is a, a very basic idea in so-called legalistic thought. Uh, this uh, legalism was a uh, uh, thought developing in around the same time as Confucian thought developed, and it was a kind of a, um, uh, if you want to say, counterculture. It was a, a counter theory to a Confucian theory, very un-Confucian, and it. Uh, resulted in the end in the uh, very despotic rule of the first emperor of the Qin dynasty. Uh, you all might know this um, uh, emperor because he had himself a gigantic uh, tomb built and a uh, uh, subterranean uh, gigantic uh, army of terracotta figures. <clears throat> and yet the Confucian scholars uh, buried alive. But you can also find that Prevention for regularity in the Confucian tradition. Uh, the Confucian think about uh, riots, regular riots that have to be taken care of, that you know, observed in the interpersonal conduct. This morning we heard already about the importance of relationships um, in Confucian China. These relationships were kind of maintained by riots, by regular riots. Then there are, of course, ideological roots to the idea of nationalness, and this basically dates to or goes back to the Taoist philosophy, stories from Zhuangzi. And there are uh, elaborations on the notion that a work of art is made according to the work of nature. In the end, it both follows and transcends rules. This is the important notion. So you get in the end the unity of nationalness and regularity, but not through following so-called dead rules, but through living rules. This translates into following the rules of nature. At this point, I should also uh, just at least mention the role of Buddhism in Chinese aesthetics and poetics, uh, because uh, the term fa I uh, referred to before denoting rule, method, law, regularity, uh, also um, plays an important role in Buddhism, in the translation of Buddhist thought in China. It uh, has a kind of a double meaning. Uh, Fa, on one hand, uh, refers to the teaching of the Buddha, to the ultimate truth. Uh, on the other hand, it also refers to the, any, phenom any, any phenomenon on earth. All the phenomena are also called Fa in, uh, the, in the Chinese translation. Dharma, just like Dharma in the uh, Sanskrit tradition. So we have uh, discussions of the Dharma of poetry. That is, of course, its rules. But in, the, um, in this discussion that, that took off from the, this Buddhist, from, from these Buddhist notions, the Dharma of poetry, that is, the rules of poetry, have to be matched by enlightenment, a Zen Buddhist notion, Shan Buddhist notion, 
Chinese Wu. And uh, in this uh, aesthetic tradition, this Wu was understood as intuitive mastery. So rules and intuitive mastery somehow go together, or rules, the leading, the following of rules in the end leads to intuitive mastery, leads to enlightenment. I'll give you some example how this notion of um, living rules or transcending rules, following rules, but at the same time transcending rules was uh, kind of uh, understood. And here, uh, one of the most prominent uh, literatus, literati of uh, a pre-modern China, Su Shi, or also, uh, also known as Su Po from the Song Dynasty, he compared his writing to a thousand gallon spring that issues forth without choosing a side. There's no knowing how it will take shape, but there's one thing I am sure of, it always goes where it should go and stops where it should stop. So here you have on one hand a Taoist image of natural creativity, but also on the other hand the idea of a living rule. And here uh, another example, this is somewhat later from the 17th century, uh, the Torah is called Yeshe. Uh, he talks about living rules uh, in the same way as there are clouds, cloud patterns on uh, Taishan, on Mount Tai. Within heaven and earth, the greatest forms of when, that means pattern or literature, are the wind and clouds, rains and the sun. Their mutations and transformations cannot be fathomed and have neither limit nor boundary. They are the highest manifestation of spirit in the universe and the perfection of when. Here, the double meaning of when is interesting, meaning at one, uh, at one, at one hand, pattern, beautiful pattern, or, or kind of uh, ornamented pattern, and on the other hand, literature. But let me speak of them from one particular point of view. The clouds of Mount Tai rise from the merest crisp, but before the morning is done, they cover the world. All at once, black clouds will mount upward and the natives of the region will read the signs by established rule. It will rain, they say, and it does not rain. And again, some clouds lit by the sun will come out and the established rule tells them it's going to be sunny and it rains. The attitudes assumed by the clouds can be counted in the tens of thousands. No two are the same. This is the natural pattern of heaven and earth. It's perfect work. But let us suppose that the pattern of heaven and earth could be set according to a rule. When Mount Tai was going to dispatch its clouds, it would first gather the troops of clouds and hold a conference with them. I am about to send a few clouds out to make the great pattern of heaven and earth. Now, you over there, I want you to go first and you follow him. I would like you to rise up, you next to him, you sink down. You should try shining in the light and you might try making a rippling motion. You back there, you should turn around as you go and come back in. And I think it would be especially nice to have you sort of roll over in the sky. This one is to begin, this one is to close. And this one here is to follow up the rear wagging its tail. If the clouds were dispatched like this and brought back home like this, there would be no vitality in any of them. And if the pattern of the universe were made in this manner, then the universe would feel burned by having a non-tie. And non-tie would feel burned by having clouds. And no clouds would ever be sent out. This also is an example of how uh, the Chinese discussed aesthetics, the way they discussed literature, by images, by stories, parables, and not discursively as we have it in the Western tradition. Hence, we get to an idea which can be coined the rule of no rule. Great works of poetry or art, they form a living organic pattern and they are not dependent on rules derived from any orthodox models. They follow the rules of nature. And in such works, of course, they come to life by creating their own rules. And it was the painter Schittau of the Qing Dynasty around 1700 who coined this uh, dictum, no rule is the ultimate rule. Who far, far, my rich, far. Here, this is an example of uh, Schittau's paintings. 
I think uh, he's one of the greatest uh, painters of pre-modern China. Third point was uh, practice leading to perfection. This is uh, what Chinese actually understand uh, with the term Kung Fu. We understand Kung Fu just only as boxing, Chinese boxing, Shaolin and stuff like that. But it's not. Uh, Kung Fu actually means constant practice in any of the arts leading to perfection. And this then leads also to natural creativity. We certainly have this concept in our tradition too. Just think about a great uh, musician, think about David Mannion, uh, the way he played the violin. It was constant practice that in the end made him play it the way it was just sound natural and ease and uh, as if there was no effort behind it. But in the end it was an awful lot of effort. So this leads in the end to intuitive mastery and uh, this intuitive mastery is illustrated by many stories from the book Chuangzi or you could refer to the Buddhist concept of enlightenment that I mentioned just before. Here, uh, give you an example of the Kung Fu of a calligrapher. Uh, in China, we have a most famous calligrapher, uh, like the saint of Chinese calligraphy. His name is Wang Xizhi. He lived in the 4th century AD. And it is said of him that he had to use up a whole pond of water to rub his ink before he could reach perfection. Mind you, that the Chinese ink is not poured into an ink slab or a bottle, but it has to be rubbed. We have an ink an ink slab, an ink stone, and then you pour water in and you have to rub, 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 rub. It just also gives you a feeling in your wrists and your arm that you need later for writing. <clears throat> Here this is the uh, most famous uh, piece of calligraphy in China of all times, the most celebrated uh, piece. Mm. Unfortunately it got lost already in the Tang Dynasty, the first emperor of the Tang. Tang Taizu, he loved it so much that he wanted to be buried with it, and since that time uh, it is gone. Uh, but since the Chinese are such great copyists, as you also probably know, uh, they already quite early made a copy of it, so we have a copy of this. We kind of know the, what it looked like. And here you have this kind of natural ease uh, displayed in this piece of grip. So we come to a first ideal of traditional Chinese aesthetics, that is to achieve a degree of artistic perfection in a work of art. And this should be imbued with a vital resonance, what the Chinese call qi yun shang dong. And this makes it in the end seem like a work of nature, and yet it conveys a sense of spiritual mastery. And you don't see any traces of conscious artistry, of conscious craftsmanship. My fourth point was suggestiveness or openness. I would call it the second ideal in Chinese aesthetics. Um, uh, Chinese, when they discuss poetry, what they say it should have a quality of a meaning beyond words, that it should reverberate in the back of your mind. You, know, that you, you cannot pinpoint the, uh, the taste of a poem to any particular, uh, let's say, um, line or whatever, but the whole poem should kind of reverberate in your mind that there should be meaning beyond words. And this, this idea goes back to an important figure in the late Tang, to Si Kung Tu. He talked about that poetry should convey images beyond images. To, uh, that it should convey scenes beyond scenes. Likewise, paintings should depict an inner reality beyond thought. So you have always these expression of beyond something, the why in Chinese why, like uh, yan wai uh, meaning beyond the words, images beyond images. Uh, there are, uh, there's of course a linguistic root to, the, uh, to this notion of suggestiveness or openness, this is the syntactical indeterminacy or ambiguity of classical Chinese syntax. Uh, the, you don't have a, a, a grammar uh, let's say, uh, as we have, for example, in the uh, awful German language, the way uh, Mark Twain described it, uh, you have, uh, which makes uh, writings, like, say, of Kant and Hegel, like, uh, half a page or a whole page possible, you know? Uh, you, would not, uh, you would not be able to make such sentences in the Chinese language. So, because of the syntactical indeterminacy. And uh, you also have, uh, because of this uh, prevalence of poetical diction, 
even in so-called philosophical texts. Uh, this morning, the question was raised if this Chinese thought was common to philosophy at all, a debated question already for a long time. Uh, this, these texts, uh, they don't uh, discuss things discursively, but in a, a very poetic condition. But there are also ideological roots to uh, this uh, notion of suggestiveness or openness. There's Taoist philosophy. There's a quote from the Book of Changes that uh, 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 describes it. That, uh, the, the quote says, words cannot completely transmit ideas or meanings. Or as the beginning of Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching said, we had this first talk here by Professor Chen about uh, Taoism and the Lao Tzu. Uh, the opening uh, sentence says that the Tao that can be spelled out can be spoken of. That's not the real Tao. So the real thing goes beyond words. <clears throat> the last point, and then I'm finished with the first section, the qualities of the artist, the poet, and here we have a main category to discuss the creative power of a poet or artist. It's in Chinese called qi. Uh, this notion, though, has no really clear-cut meaning in the history of Chinese ideas. It rather uh, changes uh, along the ages. Uh, you have a certain development. Uh, when we, we encounter first discussions on the notion of qi, uh, it's referred to as an innate quality which cannot be required. But then, later on in history, you get it as in something that can be actually cultivated, that can be required. Anyway, so qi is the first requirement of a poet artist, that is his innate talent and his acquired power of expression. And also, uh, what uh, he has to have is an imaginative capacity. In Chinese, it's called shen si, spiritual thinking. And that brings about the fusion of the artist's mind with the out, outside mind. Referring again to Su Shi, he said uh, about this capacity of his friend, famous bamboo painter, he has the complete bamboo in his mind before painting. So, he, in a way, he became bamboo when painting bamboo. There's the notion of fusion of subject and object. So, uh, all these notions that I have uh, now mentioned, uh, because of the prevalence of them, you, you have a, a tendency later on to unite uh, these things, to unite rule and no rule, uh, arriving at living rule. You have uh, the, the unification of concreteness and openness, giving way to suggestiveness. You have uh, unification of seeing with feeling, of thought and setting of self with the world and subject with object. Now I'll get to the part when I discuss uh, Kant's idea. And uh, uh, Kant's aesthetics I refer to his critique of judgment, particularly to the second part, the analysis of the sublime, the articles 45 to 49. This is, I find, particularly rich in ideas which invite a comparison with the above sketched characteristics of Chinese ethics. In the Critique of Judgment, uh, Article 45, we read, in the product of beautiful art, we must become conscious that it is art and not nature. But yet, the, purpose, the, pur the purposiveness in its form must seem to be as free from all constraint of arbitrary rules as if it were a product of mere nature. Hence, Kant's rule of nature uh, means that a work of art presupposes rules, but it must appear as being free from all constraints of arbitrary rules. It shows, in the end, no trace of the rule having been before the artist of the artist and having feathered his mental power. This is a direct quote from Kant. So, a work of art, according to Kant, is made according to the rule of nature. Now the question arises, how does the rule of nature enter into the work of art? Kant says, nature needs the medium, and he calls that the genius. Here yeah, Kant, genius is the talent or the natural gift which gives the rule to art. Since talent as the inner productive faculty of the artist belongs itself to nature, we may express the matter thus. 
Genius is the innate mental disposition through which nature gives rule to art. Kant also talks about scholastic aspects of art, and he thinks them quite necessary. Uh, so uh, he thinks that we have something that we, we, uh, these scholastic aspects, they require terms to rules, and they can only be transcended by the power of the genius. Hence, the genius can create works which are, and at the same time, are not made according to rules. And his works become then models for the inspiration of others. The crucial property constituting beautiful art for Kant uh, calls spirit, in German, Geist. This is the animating principle of the mind, that what puts the mental powers purposefully into sway. And then, in the end, we read the main faculty of the spirit is its ability of presenting so-called aesthetic ideas. Such thought, thus, cannot adequately be put in conceptual language. The faculty of creating aesthetic ideas, according to Kant, manifests itself in, in its entire strength in the art of the poet, just as in the Chinese tradition. So we have a uh, few further correspondences to Chinese notions. First of all, we have the idea of shenzi, spiritual thinking or imagination, that kind of is equivalent to Kant's spirit, the power of creating aesthetic ideas, that is, representations of the imagination. The quality, now referring again to the Chinese tradition, the quality of poetry found beyond language and the quality of merging thought with setting, feeling with landscape, this is today expressed with the word Chinese yi uh, We translate it often roughly as artistic idea, but I would propose to say that it would not be far-fetched to see a direct correspondence between this today very popular but elusive term, eating to Kant's aesthetic idea. And there's another similarity, Kant's genius and the Chinese concept of vital force. Vital force is a disposition which transmits the vital power of nature into the mental and thus artistic realm. Remember the Sushi's thousand gallon spray. And genius, on the other hand, it's Kant says, the way nature gives rules to art. The work of art is created without any signs of conscious artistry and cannot be taught to others. So we have here important notions both in the Western Kantian and the Chinese aesthetics. What are the differences? Let me first uh, refer to uh, the Western uh, aesthetic tradition. You have the notion of or originality. Uh, uh, Kant says, regarding the qualities of genius, that originality must be its first property. And then he says further, its products must be models, that is, exemplary, and they consequently ought not to spring from imitation, but must serve as a standard or rule of judgment for us. And then, it gives the rules just as nature does. The work of art shows no indication how it is brought about, and there is also no possibility to communicate to others devices or precepts that will enable them to produce similar products. So this is a very dominant notion in Western aesthetics, particularly from Romanticism, but you of course can also uh, detect it earlier. Uh, now referring to China, we have the notion of perfection. Chinese call it Gu, and uh, uh, I would say that the Chinese aesthetics places more emphasis on mastery, perfection, than on originality. Uh, it tries to achieve perfection through orientation and past models, through natural creativity, as we refer. Now, when we look at these notions closer, originality and perfection, they seem to be, both for the Western and Chinese art, they seem to be strong points and weaknesses at the same time. In the West, it's on one hand a strong point, but 
the emphasis on originality also led to a kind of a conceptualization of art. You know, today, anything goes as art, it's only original. Nobody else has done it before. So uh, you lose the truly artistic features. You also lose, lose the so-called scholastic, scholastic elements that Kant still talk about. In China, on the other hand, you have the insistence on perfection, certainly a strong point, but uh, it also has its uh, negative side, too much orientation on past models and uh, leading to stagnation in the end. Then let's compare the dis discourse on art. We have uh, in the West, let's take a Kant's and Hegel's writing as uh, examples, uh, uh, the strength is uh, that it's highly analytical, that it's systematic, that it's conceptual, that it creates a whole complex system of thought. But uh, its weakness is that it's a round and indigestible language. In Germany, we have the bon mot if you want to understand Hegel. If you're not trained as a philosopher, you should refer to the English translation. So, um, uh, the Kant's translator into English, he calls his language repulsive. On the other hand, China, you have poems on poetry. There is also uh, a weakness. They are unsystematic. They are metaphorical, ambiguous in China. So you don't get any terms defined. But you also have a strength to it. They are poetic. They are suggestive. They are, in the end, art in itself. Now, in my last part, uh, let me go to modern China, explore a little bit the, the role of aesthetics in modern China and its encounter with Western thought. I have already, at the beginning, given you a few hints to that, that uh, the role of aesthetics, uh, the aesthetics played a special role for China and its counter with Western thought. It was, first of all, a realm free of politics. It was free of Confucian ideology. As you might know, Confucianism was condemned at the beginning of modern China, uh, particularly after the losses in the Opium Wars and after the loss against the, Jap the war against Japan, as being responsible for the backwardness of China. And so Confucianism was kind of thrown up on the uh, garbage of pile of history. Right now, I'm trying to get back what uh, can be uh, a wealth of fascinating, fascinating new ideas. They were searching for familiar concepts, and they saw the possibility of aligning the foreign ideas with their own tradition. Hence, one can really underline that aesthetics assumed a paramount position in China's encounter with European thought. Uh, one figure is particularly important in this regard, his name is Tsai Yun-Pei. He was, uh, the, uh, uh, among others, he was the uh, rector of um, the Beida University, Beijing University, Peking University, uh, the crucial May 4th movement, the time of the May 4th movement, around 1919. And he is also one of the originators of uh, the so called cultural pathetic self understanding of China. Mind you that he uh, was widely traveled, he studied in Germany, he got his PhD in Germany, so he was familiar with Occidental philosophy, but also with the Chinese was particularly familiar with Khan. Uh, and he had the idea that Westerners at this time, today might be different, uh, that uh, Westerners are largely of the shape determined by their religion, by their Christian religion. China, on the other hand, he thought that aesthetics, as a combination of ritual, of art, and ethics, would be a functional spiritual equivalent to religion in the West. It was an important notion that he had at the beginning of the 20th century. And hence he demanded for modern China aesthetic education in the place of religion. Uh, for this reason, today we still have in China the discussion of aesthetic education. It plays an important role in the uh, Chinese uh, discourse. Or uh, to uh, name another one, Wang Go Wei, he is also representative for the early encounter of Chinese with European ideas. He uh, coined basic aesthetic concepts for the 20th century. He coined these words that I had there before, Jingjie, aesthetic state of consciousness, or Yijing, the aesthetic 
idea, artistic idea, aesthetic idea. And with that, he uh, tries to denote a perf perfect aesthetic fusion of artistic idea with a concrete scene. So this is the essence, in a way, of Chinese poetry, yeah? of painting, too. You know, a, a concrete scene in a, po in a poem, you usually have a nature image, and you imbue it with feeling. You, let, you actually let nature speak instead of a, 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 a human voice. <coughs> that nature speak for the human feelings. And um, these terms uh, of Wang Gaoways, like I Ching and Jin Jie, they uh, were derived from the Chinese tradition, particularly um, with reference to Buddhist uh, thought, uh, this, uh, uh, particularly this term Jin, I Ching or Jin Jie, don't want to go into it now if you go too far. Uh, but it is also imbued this meaning that you found in Kan and in Schopenhauer. And in a way, it is an equivalent, as I said earlier, uh, suggested earlier to Kant's aesthetic idea. Hence, they represent early intercultural exchanges of thought between China and the West. Uh, when Wang Wei first used Jingjie, he used it only with regards to poetry, without any theoretical explanation. He did not define this term whatsoever. But this term, Jinjie typically, soon gained a general aesthetic meaning that uh, signifies both an aesthetic idea as well as a most sublime state of mind. And it's one of the most popular uh, terms uh, in Chinese academic discourse. Here, I'll give you an example of Li Zohu, certainly the most important present-day uh, cultural philosopher of China, living in the US at the moment, and Liu Gangti. And they said uh, that the most important characteristic of traditional Chinese aesthetics is the idea that an aesthetic consciousness, shen wei jin jie, that was regarded as the highest and noblest consciousness to be attained in life. So Li Zohou is very important. Liu Kang Qi, one last uh, thought about him, he wrote an article about the spreading and influence of German aesthetics in China. Uh, he points out that modern Chinese aesthetics is largely formed by dealing with the German tradition of aesthetics, modern Chinese aesthetics, mind you. But due to the enormous problems of translation, uh, the whole German tradition of aesthetics from Baumgart and Kahn to Marx and Heidegger was received in China with a phase shift of about 100 to 150 years. And then you have the discourse of Chinese aesthetics of the 20th century, what I have not talked about now, you have it largely shaped by the categories and questions of German philosophy of the 18th and 19th century. The concept of beauty, mind you, nature, Chinese aesthetics is beautology, but beauty is in a way completely absent in Chinese tradition. For that reason, it's a kind of a very weird modern uh, um, discipline in the Chinese aesthetics. Aesthetics today in China and the West, in the West, you can say it's a subject with a purely academic interest. It is certainly not a vital, intellectually inspiring tradition anymore. I would dare to say that the general public does not care about aesthetics at all. But in China, the characteristics of Chinese aesthetics, they are understood by the Chinese themselves as the most sublime features of Chinese culture. Hence, it's a fundamental element of Chinese cultural identity. I mentioned earlier aesthetic fever in regards to Li Zohou in the 1980s. This is something that would be completely unthinkable in the West, but it did happen in China. Yeah, I'll get to my final remarks, and I will read that from my paper. Uh, around the world, we now have Western priorities everywhere we look, also in arts and aesthetics. According to these standards, art has to be conceptually innovative. It has to serve a liberating function or should at least be politically critical, not to mention the achievements, let me put that in quotation mark, brought about by the Dadaism and such. In contrast to these tendencies, we have a largely extinct 
Chinese tradition with completely different priorities. There, a work of art, first of all, should possess suggestive poetic qualities, that is, an enriching capacity beyond the actual work, in painting or in poetry. Also, an artist ought to have perfect intuitive control over the artistic medium, the, Chan, the Wu, the uh, Buddhist Wu, through long and arduous practice, as in Chinese collective, Kung Fu. Only then will he be able to create great works of art with a spiritual impact. The majority of Chinese artists in and out of China follow the Western trend, consciously or unconsciously. But Western style modernity is only the continuation of a long local tradition, a long local cultural tradition, I should say. And just as Western modern modernity is unthinkable without a constant re-engagement with its own long history and tradition, so too is there a possibility that China, on her way into global modernity, might also become more aware of her cultural tradition as an object of active engagement. Because of the increasing Western interest, the rediscovery of the tradition might even serve as a means for further cultural and artistic exchange. There is already an over 100 year long history of stimulation of Western artists by East Asian art, from the Art Nouveau of the late 19th century up to Mark Toby and others in the 20th century. The encounter of cultures has not just begun in the last decade. It has only gained a new dimension in the age of globalization. It has to be seen how artists will arrange themselves in their moves between different cultures and traditions, as well as in their gaining multiple identities. And thus only time will tell to which hybrid forms of art and of aesthetics this will lead to. If there will be great works of art resulting from this fusion and whether or not the rich Chinese artistic and aesthetic tradition will still play a significant part in this encounter. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we proceed to the exciting open forum. Let me just remind you the inquirer should state his or her name, institutional affiliation, and country. Only one question per participant. Make it direct, make it simple, only aesthetic ideas, please, okay? And exercise due prudence, okay? Wait until you are called, okay? Thank you very much. Now, let us first see a few hands. Let's try the others from the back. Maybe there are some intellectually stimulated people over there. Yes? Okay, yeah, let's ask for brother over here. Thank you very much for your paper, and it was really hard to speak, so, so thanks a lot. And uh, I have uh, one question, uh, but related to two points, uh, just of clarification. Um, when you were talking at the beginning about the uh, um, Western aesthetics, you said that we encounter uh, systematic treatises on beauty, in Plato and Aristotle, is that right? Because well, I would like to say that there is no systematic uh, treaty on beauty in Aristotle and in Plato. Uh, so it is the first point. And the second point is, uh, I don't know if uh, you take into account the difference between language and meta-language. So uh, the last part related to this aesthetic fever it is what you what you mean because aesthetic is a theory of beauty or of art. So you mean that all Chinese people were uh, the, it was a theory about beauty, or it was an artistic fever. So it, 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 it's important to uh, make this difference. So when we teach aesthetics uh, at Western universities, it is a theory of beauty or theory of art, and it can be art, but it is a different area. So, just uh, the point I would like to ask. Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, let me clarify first. I uh, tried to correct myself when I said uh, that we had an Aristotle, uh, of course, uh, a systematic discussion of uh, poetics. 
we have this point if you want to the uh, yeah right so uh, uh, discussing the three uh, main categories of uh, literature and uh, one part of the poetics is the last on the uh, on comedy uh, which made uh, the book quite this famous book on him the rose and uh, uh, this uh, prime story about that and about the aesthetic fever in uh, the 80s, what was the aesthetic fever of the 80s? It, you had a kind of a, a flood of publications on Chinese aesthetics. And uh, what was underlined in these uh, works, uh, this idea of the uh, self-understanding of the Chinese culture as an, aesthetic, as an essentially aesthetic culture. This was the, 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 the main topic of the aesthetic fever. So the way that the Chinese understand themselves since the beginning of the modernity, as you, I mentioned with regards to China and Pei, that this has been a very, very important element of their kind of their culture. This uh, idea had been brought up again, and that, that led to a flood of writings uh, in, in, that, in that period. And that's what's called the aesthetic theme. Hope I clarify. Thank you, Doctor. Sister Julia from the Ecclesiastical Faculties of Philosophy and Theology. I'm struck with the concept of the Fa and the Li. I would like to get more elaboration or explanation of the relationship. When I, when I heard about Fa and the Li, if the Fa is distorted or there are some distortions, Naturally, the Li is also affected. That is why the relationship is also affected. I'd like to get some more uh, elaboration on this in order to understand better biotology, the Fa and the Li as its foundational elements for aesthetics. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, fa actually means law. And you have, uh, for example, in the aesthetic tradition, uh, in terms of painting, you have uh, the so-called Liofa, the six laws of painting, which the first one that I mentioned, the uh, vital resonance, vital resonance. This is the first law of painting. But later on in the Chinese uh, uh, aesthetic writing, you uh, get constant reference to, you, uh, uh, you have a kind of a whole range of writings that discuss the, the laws of poetry, the method of poetry, how to write poetry. And this uh, question, method or law, was, uh, or this idea was the, the term fa was used. Uh, law, method. And I try to uh, get back to the ideological origins of this term fa. And I mentioned that fa, from its early usage in political writing, means uh, law as in terms of uh, the law in, in jurisdiction. And uh, we have a, actually a school of thought that's the so-called law school. But this law school is certainly not a school that uh, proclaimed um, um, uh, um, uh, legal thought as we have it today. It proclaimed laws that were to strictly be followed. Strictly be followed. If not, then you'd be severely punished. And uh, you had in the uh, so-called Qin dynasty, that uh, was only last for only about 20 years uh, in the early in the third century BC, you had this uh, ideology put into practice in the reign of the first Qin uh, emperor of Qin dynasty that I mentioned. And so uh, you have, in a way, mm, um, a, 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 a bottom to this idea of fa, of rule, that is uh, uh, kind of uh, imbued with this uh, thought that uh, was received later on in Chinese history ideas as a rather bad school, you know, and never really played a role again in Chinese history of ideas. Uh, interestingly, only then again, only one time popped up again, it was uh, in the Mao period, in the German Cultural Revolution. 
when the legalist thought again was appraised as being a superior to the Confucian tradition. I only want to mention that as a kind of a sideline, as if it's a kind of more a footnote, and uh, it's uh, not actually so uh, important. Uh, the of this ideology. Yes. And what was the other term again? Uh, Fa and Li. Uh, well, which which term did you mean again? Uh, or is that enough as an answer to your question? Thank you, Dr. Gordon. It satisfies it. There's a very eager hand in the back, yes. Sir Rodrigo Benes from the Nassau University. Uh, my question is a certain clarification concerning on if Chinese aesthetics is free from political ideology, which you mean an example of Confucian ideology. Why is that Chinese uh, aesthetics much focus on the notion of qi as the vital force, wherein at first it's been taken as uh, an innate which sooner or later needs to be cultivated. Which is, I think, in my own understanding, that notion of key is somehow a Tao's influence on, on uh, Chinese aesthetics. If it's free from any political ideology, why is that there is the notion of key? Thank you. Well, uh, let me first of all say that uh, Chinese aesthetics is certainly not uh, completely free of Confucian thought. Chinese aesthetics is a uh, is actually something that uh, as, as such that never exists. It is a, a modern conceptualization of certain features of the Chinese artistic and literary tradition. And uh, you can only refer to the history of Chinese aesthetics as uh, a history of how Chinese referred to qualities of art of literature. And they referred to the qualities of art and of literature uh, during the uh, times in different ways. You had at times more Confucian notions that were important in the evaluation of art and literature. And you had at other points you had uh, Taoist notions and later on Buddhism only very late came in to be an important um, school of thought which gave the Chinese uh, ideas with which to discuss uh, qualities of art in, in literature. So uh, for that reason, you certainly do have uh, lots of Confucian ideas in this history of dealing with art and literature. Uh, I only singled out now uh, certain aspects that I found particularly interesting for inviting a uh, conversation with Kant's uh, uh, critique of judgment. And these elements that I pointed out, I also find particularly relevant, significant uh, during the whole history of Chinese uh, art and literature. But I don't want to say, uh, I tried to mention that at the beginning, that I would just only pick out a few elements that I found significant. That this does not comprise all of uh, Chinese aesthetics, if you want to call it that. You know, that you certainly do also have very important Confucian notions. But they did not lead me to kind of converse with Kant's uh, critique of judgment. That's why I left them out. I had one hour time, uh, and uh, I had gone into dealing with. Uh, uh, every aspect of Chinese aesthetics, so I would have to read you my book, 400 pages, and we would be still sitting there at the same next week. So uh, that would be no point. Uh, the other thing was you asked about qi, right? The notion of qi. Well, uh, qi is a, is, a, is a very elusive term in Chinese history of ideas. It has a, has, a com has a whole range of meanings, and you cannot really pinpoint it to anything very concretely. It's uh, basic meaning is probably something like breath or like air or steam. Something that, that is there and at the same time is not there. You know, that's the, you cannot see breath, you cannot see air. Uh, and, uh, but you can feel it, you can feel its power. And for this reason, 
uh, qi is something that, that works in everywhere. And in the end, also works in us, in human beings, as a kind of a, a vital type of force. So it's the, the, uh, the, the, that, that gives kind of the life to things, that it brings about things. In the end, later on, in the, uh, since the Song Dynasty, since the 12th century, around about the 11th century, uh, Qi became a very um, important notion in the, in the philosophy of Neo Confucians, which uh, a lot more resembles a, a philosophy in our history than, let's say, the early Confucian, because it created a very kind of intricate system of thought, and you have a kind of a, a dualism. Uh, in the end, similar to, let's say, to Aristotle, form and matter uh, in terms of the, 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 the idea of the thing, also the platonic idea, the, the material force. The material force, uh, uh, this is also the way the Chinese then uh, use this term qi. But in aesthetics, it has a completely different role. You know, so you have one and the same character playing completely different roles in this field and that field. No, but I think we have that in Western thought as well. But it means like a vital power. Thank you very much, Doctor. It's very good, sir. And then, let's have it. Thank you, Professor, for presenting uh, philosophy of aesthetics. As you were talking, I thought there was a poet talking because there were many reverberations. I, for example, thought of art, lies in conceding art. I remember the Nicholas of Cusa, Coincidencia, Oppositorum, coming together, opposites, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'd like to make a reference to one of those reverberations and ask your comment on it. And that is in reference to the Chinese situation especially after the arrival of Buddhism. Uh, you spoke about the uh, rules of art at the same time. No room is the ultimate rule. It is a uh, say. Well, I was reminded of, for example, the Chan Buddhism. Uh, one type of subdivision of it is the uh, a uh, gradual illumination where you go on practicing and practicing and practicing and ultimately it becomes spontaneous. Okay, yeah. So, uh, art lies in conceding art. They call it aiming without aiming. And another thing also, that is the same type of religion, uh, when you look at some of the paintings, Chinese paintings, you see uh, maybe somebody in a boat, maybe a mountain, and most of the painting is empty. It reflects the doctrine of emptiness. So I would like you to comment, because that's something that you didn't explicitly refer to, I said that there were other elements involved in aesthetics, like religion, philosophy, etc. So I'd like you to comment. There seems to be a world view of the Chinese, which flows out into their artistic art. If I'm thinking of an emptiness worldview, it comes out in the art. Yeah, very fascinating question. And, uh, uh, this, of course, uh, opens up a whole a new range of uh, things, and I'll try to be very brief. Uh, the idea of the, the ultimate rule is no rule, you know, uh, that I had to pinpoint to ship out. Uh, the, end of the 18th century. Uh, this, uh, of course, you can trace back to Chan Buddhist thought. Chan Buddhist, you know, it's both, both. And Chan Buddhism, mind you, is a, uh, is a fusion of Taoism and Buddhism in China. It is the most, it is the quintessential Chinese school of Buddhism. You know, usually it's referred to some China, uh, Japanese Zen, but it's uh, only lately, so it's essentially Chinese because of its Taoist elements. And there you have the, also the idea that, uh, like in Chan Buddhism, the, the, the instant enlightenment, you know, the, the uh, sudden enlightenment, this is something that you cannot get uh, through method. You cannot get that through following a rule. 
in such things. You know? So uh, you have the idea in Chan for no rules are, no rule, no method. You know? And this led uh, in the end um, to the uh, notion of no rule being the ultimate rule. You know? This is in a way a Chan Buddhist thought, Taoist thought. Then uh, the notion of emptiness. Yeah, the Chinese uh, like uh, uh, to not uh, uh, completely fill up a, 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 a scroll of those figures. Uh, actually, mind you, you have in, in China both ways. You have in China two aesthetic traditions. You have kind of the literati tradition, and you have the folksy tradition, if I want to call it that way. Uh, the folksy tradition likes to have a uh, fully Full uh, paintings. You see them particularly in so-called New Year's paintings. If you look around around Chinese New Year's, they have everywhere like, the paintings and they're the color most colorful and you've got everything on it that you can imagine. You know, this is a kind of an aesthetic of fullness of plenty. But then you have, on the other hand, in the Literati tradition, an aesthetic of emptiness that is largely shaped by Buddhist thought, by Chan Buddhist thought. Emptiness are playing an important role, one of the most important uh, notions in uh, Buddhism, particularly the way the Chinese develop Buddhism. You know? Mind you, emptiness is often misunderstood. Emptiness is understood as being kind of a void, being nothing. But emptiness is actually uh, it means completely different. It means like uh, creation or, 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 or being, how shall I translate that? Uh, 
uh, that's actually all, all I want to do. You know, I could, could not uh, try to try to uh, tackle uh, the, the scope of uh, the realm that, that you just kind of uh, pointed out. You know, it's just I would overdo myself and uh, it, it just to uh, uh, compare uh, uh, the writings and compare to the aesthetics. Uh, as far as I you know, uh, they try to. Kind of Can be overlooked, it can be handled, that everything else could not be handled, that would just kind of completely uh, uh, break up uh, any barrier. And uh, I, I try to kind of point out uh, comparisons that, in my view, are, are, are meaningful, not just kind of interesting to, to take note of. Uh, mind you, that uh, uh, Kantian aesthetics today does not play very much of a role in it. You know, like it was kind of, uh, you have the romanticism coming after that and then completely done away with that. But on, on the other hand, he, he originated some of the important romantic ideas that's about genius, you know, about originality, you know. But uh, Hunt was still kind of uh, turning to the scholastic aspects, that means the methodology. He would still kind of say, a painter, he has to know how to paint, you know. If he doesn't know, it's just like a Paints and says, well, do this, that, that, and hang up and put it in, uh, to Venice and buy it on one on, on castle. It's not up. You know. He would be uh, very much dissatisfied with stuff like that. So, but the, the development of this world in the Western tradition has completely gone off that track. So that's all I want to say. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Paul. We're out of time. I apologize. So thank you. A round of applause for him. <laughs> of course, for all the questions.